It's my great honor to introduce a, a, a colleague and friend and uh, one of the great conservationists I've, I've had the opportunity to, to know in my career. Um, when I first got to know Wendy Paulson, it's almost 25 years ago, I, I'd say, uh, when uh, Wendy was working in Illinois organizing uh, the Chicago Wilderness Area at that time, a, a coalition of many local organizations to protect and restore open space in the Chicago area. Uh, Wendy got involved with the Nature Conservancy when I, when I was there, and she was actually planting native prairies. Um, anybody ever plant native prairies before? Uh, <laughs> Wendy knows how to do it. She's quite an expert at it. Where all a lot of these warblers uh, 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 need habitat. Um, when uh, Wendy then became uh, vice chair of the Nature Conservancy's uh, board of governors, uh, ten years ago, moved to New York City. There you go. Keep those birds going. <laughs> all right. Before this is over, everybody has to press theirs at one time, and then we're going to have an aviary in here, right? Um, when Wendy came to New York, she regretted leaving Illinois, but she got so involved in things in New York, doing bird walks in Central Park uh, all the time, uh, became active with Audubon, volunteering with a wonderful program called For the Birds, where Wendy went into classrooms in the South Bronx, teaching young teenagers about birds in the city. Now, that's no small task. I've watched Wendy uh, in a classroom of 14, 15-year-old, mostly African-American teenagers in the South Bronx teaching them about birding, and she had them transfixed. This is no small accomplishment. Uh, it was really quite amazing, and she now has a whole team of volunteers that go out into schools all around uh, New York City uh, teaching s learning skills through birds. Uh, throughout. It was her program and did an absolutely fabulous job. Um, and now that Wendy's in Washington, she's leading birding walks here in Rock Creek Parkway and doing the same thing. Uh, she is the chair uh, of the board of directors of RARE, a wonderful international organization that we partner with uh, extensively. Uh, still active with the Nature Conservancy State Program, former chair of the New York State Board, the Illinois State Board. Uh, a board of uh, trustees of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and a whole long list of other things. Uh, and someone who, is, who, who walks the walk. Uh, she not only knows about it, but she does it every day as a volunteer, as a leader, as a professional teacher. Um, we're honored to have you with us today, Wendy. Please come up. Thanks, John, so much. It's really great. I, I miss seeing John in Central Park as we very often would run into each other. Central Park tends to be one of those places in the middle of the city where you cross paths um, regularly. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today, delighted to have so many of you join us. And uh, I, you, anytime anybody wants to uh, punctuate the talk with one of your bird calls, that would be just fine. <laughs> um, I've been asked by the Audubon team <clears throat> to give a personal perspective on my experience um, with neotropical birds. It's an especially fun assignment for me because I actually started paying serious attention to birds when I lived in Washington 35 years ago. Um, our, my husband and I lived in Great Falls at the time, and uh, we, the house that we rented came with a green platform um, bird feeder that was outside the dining room window, um, and I loved learning to, to uh, identify the birds that came to the seed that I, that I put there. I was teaching at the Potomac School at the time, and I used dozens of acres of the wooded campus there as an extension of the classroom for my second graders. We found a pair of barred owls in the woods, a species I knew nothing about, and used to go out after lunch to look for them, often with success. Little by little, I was waking to the world of birds. On weekends, my husband and I sometimes went to Assateague Island. One September, we met a team of raptor biologists banding peregrine falcons. My husband had been keenly interested in birds of prey since childhood. I knew next to nothing about them. But the biologists' enthusiasm for their work and their eagerness to share their knowledge arrested my interest. I returned many times to help them in their search for the magnificent peregrines as they headed to South America for the winter. Because it was the early 70s and the peak of the DDT crisis, the peregrines were few and far between. But there were thousands of shorebirds on the move. Sandpipers, plovers, dunlin, turnstones, oyster catchers, dowitchers. My head spun with the spectacle of wheeling shorebird flocks and the confusion of mixed species. But I had patient teachers. I was totally hooked. That winter I was not teaching, as we were expecting our first child. I took long walks and began to notice birds I'd never seen before. A neighbor loaned me his powerful camera lens to photograph waterfowl at Roach's Run near the airport. I took several classes at the Audubon Naturalist Society on bird identification. 
the miracle of migration was beginning to dawn on me. When spring arrived, my husband and I headed to Pennyfield Lock on the CNO Canal to see if we could find some of the birds I was learning about, birds that had spent the winter in the tropics, in the Caribbean, Mexico, Central America, even as far away as Brazil and Argentina and Paraguay. <laughs> the larger birds I could identify easily, scarlet tanager, Baltimore <laughs> oriole, rose-breasted grosbeak, barn swallow, the smaller neotropical migrants, I'd begun to use that term by then, were more challenging, but I was determined. Before long, I was identifying vireos and warblers and was completely, irretrievably captivated by the challenge. Somehow, I thought those migrants passed only along the CNO Canal. That was a magic corridor, as I saw it. Then something interesting happened. I had begun to learn bird songs after a surreal rock walk with Chandler Robbins, author of The Golden Guide to North American Birds. And I began to hear songs in our Great Falls yard. We had wonderful tall oaks, and one day I distinctly recall thinking, my gosh, that's a red start. And I think I hear a black-throated green warbler. It seems foolish to me now, but such was my ignorance that I had not realized that the same birds that were streaming along the CNO corridor were also passing through the treetops of Great Falls and anywhere else they could find food and rest in their dramatic northward journey each spring. Such was the beginning of what has been a 35-year captivation with these extraordinary feathered creatures. Wherever I have lived, wherever I travel, they have become to me very special, very beautiful, and immensely interesting wild neighbors. Or in many instances, longtime friends briefly stopping in during their twice annual journey between northern latitudes and the tropics. In appreciation of my early teachers, I began to lead bird walks when I moved to Illinois and had become acquainted with the bird life and migration patterns there. I did the same, as John mentioned, in New York City's Central Park, which I might add is one of the world's best places to learn about migratory songbirds. They drop into the park abundantly and are easy to see. If I have only one day each spring to go birding, I'd probably opt for Central Park. Just recently, as John also mentioned, I completed a series of walks in the Potomac Gorge in Rock Creek Park. It was in many ways a wonderful homecoming to the roots of my interest in birds. But for me, birds go well beyond the walks in search of them, as pleasurable as those are. They have brought an unspeakable richness to daily living. When I wake to the ethereal, flute-like song of the wood thrush here in Washington, I can feel nothing but joy. When I gaze at the neon orange and black and white pattern on the diminutive Blackburnian warbler, fresh from the forests of Columbia, I marvel at the beauty and feel deep wonder at the journey of that half-ounce jewel from the South American jungle to the boreal forests of Canada. Birds have been a source of friendships, new exposures, rich experiences. They have been the impetus for travel, hiking, study, writing, sketching, and teaching. As I have traveled to different parts of the world, they have served as an international language, a bond with naturalists in other countries. When a new friend in Colombia shows me a green and gold tanager in his country, we both feel the same thrill at the utterly unique combination of design and color. When we find a great crested flycatcher, we both know that the bird is spending the dry season, our winter, in the tropics and will fly north for the summer to breed in the temperate zone. One of hundreds of species that travel centuries-old migratory routes and stitch together our hemisphere year after year. And we know that what happens to the bird's habitat on both ends of that journey will determine its appearance to future students of nature. I think that ultimately, it is that eternal continuity that migratory birds represent that makes them such unique emblems of the natural order. Their age-old movements over hundreds and thousands of miles represent a stable phenomenon in an often unstable world. I was living in New York City in 2001 and was in Central Park with good friends on September 11th watching fall migrants. We still try to reune each year in the park on that day because for each of us, the inevitable push of the migrants was an undeniable affirmation of life and vitality.